Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. Great to be back in this seat behind the microphone with you on the other side of this Riverside screen with a guest who is an old friend of the show, super successful journalist, really digs in on the topics that come to him and he's never lacking with his passion. But Tim, I want to dig into your mood. How are you today? What's going on, sir? <laughs> Not much. I'm doing great over here. Thanks a lot for asking. Yeah, very excited to introduce this conversation that we had with, I'll say it, Lance, say legendary it. journalist Steve Fishman. And this is his new podcast. He has done several in the past, including the runaway hit Empire on Blood. But this one is called My Friend, the Serial Killer. And it's a very interesting story about Steve and his relationship with serial killer Robert F. Carr III. So this is definitely a show you want to check out and really had an interesting conversation with him. Yeah, we did span quite a number of topics in this conversation because at this point we're like old buds with Steve. His company, Orbit Media, is fantastic. You can go to orbitmedia.fm and you can check out all the work. And you mentioned, Tim, he had the runaway hit, the fantastic show Empire on Blood. That's also being re-released with some new information and sort of like a director's cut, so to speak. If you haven't listened to Empire on Blood, give it a shot for the first time. If you have, check out the re-release for all the new nuggets that came his way in the meantime. Okay, so we really hope you enjoy this conversation. Make sure to follow us on social media at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. We're going to break quick for commercial here, and we'll be right back with Steve Fishman. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Welcome back to the podcast. Steve Fishman, how are you today? Oh, I am not terrible. <laughs> That's my, my, new, my new optimism shining through. Huh? Not terrible is a wonderful way to answer that question. And I always get so excited when we're able to say welcome back to the show. A return guest is always welcome here. And you were one of the one of the most interesting and best guests that we had. I think, Tim, we said this was 2018 that we had Steve on. I think so. Yeah. I hadn't heard a podcast like Empire on Blood before then or since then. Um, I will say that our show Dark Valley is right up there against Empire on Blood. But when I listened to that show for the first time, I was so excited to have you on and I'm so excited to have you back on. What have you been up to? How are you doing other than not terrible? I'm good. But, you know, the, the six years uh, suggests that uh, we all have survived the podverse, well, supposed implosion, you know, if you believe what you read and. It's probably somewhat true, yeah. So we're we're still here, we're still kicking, we're still making stuff, and that's exciting. And by the way, congratulations about Dark Valley. It really was a, a kind of stellar representative of the genre. With Empire on Blood, what we decided to do, it was seven episodes back then. I spent kind of seven years in and out of that story following one murder, one murder case, uh, following one guy as he fought for his freedom. And, you know, there were times when I didn't know if he was innocent. You know, I kind of teamed up with his private investigator, this fantastic character who was a born again, uh, you know, had a church in his house and carried a gun and a Bible and, and of course didn't drive. I, I don't know quite how that fits in, but it, it always struck me as well is that the, the tough private investigator had to be driven around by whoever he could find. Uh, but he and I actually took a train and found these two women, sisters, who turned out to be eyewitnesses to the crime and who in the end really helped determine who did the murders. And I'm not going to give it away even now. It is a podcast with a payoff, and those are very, very hard to find. And then what happened is, Listen, it's six years later. That podcast did well. It was really well received. It was number one. And I've been in touch with the characters who are in it. I've become friends with the main subject, Cal, and friends with Emel, who was the jailhouse lawyer. Their lives have gone on for six years. And there's real substantive changes, which I am sure listeners will be fascinated by. You know, what happens, Emel, as we know in the podcast, gets out of on parole. Well, he's not a guy who gives up. 
He gets involved with the district attorney and his life takes a turn for the better. And I will say the same about Calvin Buari, who's the star. And then there's the detective in the case, a guy who goes by Father Frank because people like to confess with him. Well, I'll, I'll, I will give away that his confessions have gone, come under scrutiny again, and some have compared him, used in the same breath as his name, the name of Detective Louis Scarcella, who is a fa- then famous, now infamous detective in Brooklyn. 20 of the people he helped put away have had their convictions overturned. And he's actually the subject of what I think of sometimes as a companion podcast to Empire on Blood, which is The Burden, which we put out recently. And that detective cooperated with our podcast exclusively. He didn't talk. And now he really tells the whole story. And it's pretty fascinating to be inside a crime story from the point of view of the detective, which, you know, happens so rarely. Yeah, for sure. And you just brought up the burden. Might as well take the opportunity to elaborate on that. Can you tell us as much as you feel comfortable telling us about how you started the burden and how do you manage to work a relationship with a character like that so you can get the information you need? It's a good question because it was not easy. You know, it's I come from New York Magazine and so I had some practice kind of creating relationships with people. I mean, my big relationship there that was kind of the headline was Bernie Madoff from prison kind of became my confidant or I became his confidant. And so he talked to me at length and that was fascinating. And that took, I think, a year to, to land him. And then, you know, I moved to true crime. I mean, Bernie Madoff is true crime as well, but I moved to a bit more kind of blood and guts, true crime, and, you know, did this story, Empire on Blood, about Calvin, and really, you know, was able to form relationships with all of the characters. The person who was convicted, the prosecutor, Turtle Man, because turtles roam free in his house, Detective Father Frank. And I I think that it's a process of getting to know somebody, being there, representing that you're going to tell their story and kind of being willing to be that stalker, (laughs) that stalker. With Detective Scarcella, he had kind of hit hold on the media for 10 years because he had become in the headlines, Detective Disgrace. And the media really just pilloried him. And, you know, as much as we're all part of the media, I I think we know that that when, you know, the media gets sent of a story, a storyline gets fixed and you can't really change it, it gets repeated and there's a pile on. So I kind of went to him with that notion that, listen, everything bad about you that's that could be said has been said. I know there's another story to tell. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you come visit me at Banya? his favorite Russian bathhouse. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if he wanted to make sure I wasn't wearing a wire or not, you know, because... <laughs> that's, that's one way to make sure. Yeah, in a, in a bathing suit. So, uh, you know, we, we kind of made friends, even though, you know, I kind of was put through a series of tests. I mean, I go into the sauna and he beats me with oak leaves and lectures me about how it's it's like having a third kidney. It takes the toxins out of you. And then... He was president of the Polar Bear Club. He's a kind of for years was a real big shot in Coney Island. And that's the Coney Island Polar Bears Club. Those are the crazy people who jump into the Atlantic Ocean on New Year's Day. He swims year round in in the Atlantic off Coney Island. And so he said, why don't we take a plunge in the Atlantic? It was March. March is colder than January. (laughs) It'll it'll actually take your breath away. like hard to breathe, but I jumped in a couple times. Finally, one day I said to to Louis, Detective Scarcell, I said, so I passed the test. And he said, pass the test. And he sat down in the studio with us. And frankly, you know, he talked and talked and talked. You know, I find, and I'm sure you guys do, when people start to talk, they reveal themselves. Even when they don't want to, even when they don't intend to, you know, kind of start to get stories, oh, this happened and this happened. And I'll give you an example from The Burden. Detective Scarcella is from a mob family. He had a beloved uncle who was a 
captain in the Colombo crime family. I mean, beloved and close, and Louis adored him and, you know, tells stories about being in the car with his uncle when he's 12 years old and shots come through the windshield. You know, Louis just falls in love with his uncle at that point. And Louis had never told this story, but he told it to me at length. His uncle is a suspect in murder, and Louis is assigned to investigate the case. So Detective Scarcella is investigating his uncle for murder. And it's kind of an amazing story. It's an amazing story that he tells, and an amazing thing that happened inside the NYPD. There's lots of stuff like that. And I, I will say one more thing about kind of getting people to talk is that I do really try to see the world through the eyes of the people I'm talking to. So, you know, I suspend disbelief. I know a lot of journalists will want to be combative and, you know, ask really hard questions, sometimes gotcha questions. And I really like to be able to spend time with people and assure them that, you know, their story is worth telling and I'm here to to learn about it. And, you know, let's hold hands and build that bridge together. Uh, You know, I'm not insincere. Maybe have a talent for sincerity. You know, I do think that the ability to be empathetic really is an ability that works when you're a journalist. So what's happening with Empire on Blood as far as it being re-released? I understand there's a a re-release. Yeah, you know, listen, the the music industry does this a lot, you know, remixes, re-releases. We just thought it's a great story. It's evergreen. You know, in true crime, we're all doing, always doing stories that are, are historic, that are not taking place at the moment. And this one, you know, has it all. The great characters, the great plot, the twists. It's six years old. The company that funded it, went out of business. So it was an orphan. I went to them and pleaded and begged. And then of course, wrote a check and got it back and then took it down so nobody could hear it. And we decided that we would re-release it because it was a great show. And also because there were these advances in people's lives. You know, the show ends chronologically in 2018. It's 2024. So these people have had big lives since then. You know, I will say the infamous went to famous, the unhappy went to happy, and the reverse as well. So we added three bonus episodes, you know, really with some stuff that got cut, and then with a lot of other stuff that we've, you know, gone out and newly recorded, but really about the characters and their lives and their development and what happens to people who you you think you know while you're doing the podcast and while you're listening to the podcast. What is, in your mind, the importance of delivering that information to your listeners? Like the updates, revisiting the characters. You have a choice to do that or not, and you obviously find that important. What do you want the listeners to take from that? Why is it important for you? I don't know. When I listen to a podcast, I get very involved with the characters. Characters are always my way into a story. You know, we do that with TV too. We do that with, just like we do with audio. And feeling like I know something, I get disappointed that the story ends. Um, I get disappointed that I'm cut off from them in a certain period of time. So I think it's natural to want to know what happens to them. You know, we have... dropped them out of our lives as listeners at a very dramatic moment in their lives. You know, Cal comes to the end of his his hearing. His life changes at that moment. Well, six years on, his life has changed again. And I think people will be really surprised. So the reason you make any story is because I think of the way that it grips us, the characters speak to us, the characters enthrall us. What happens to them is interesting. And there's a certain kind of, I think both in the bonus episodes and in the first seven episodes too, there's a certain kind of soulfulness. I mean, these are people who really open up. You know, in our first episode, Cal, who is a big time drug dealer, a very tough guy, He's in tears. He brings us into his world. And so now what we're saying is his world doesn't end. In fact, it takes a huge turn 
and Cal is leading another life. I will give you a hint. When he was in prison, he wrote seven business plans because Cal, the drug dealer, always thought of himself as a businessman. He didn't necessarily think of himself as a drug dealer. And he wanted to always be a businessman, an entrepreneur. And uh, some of that some of that comes true in a really surprising way. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. I would love to talk with you about smokescreen my friend the serial killer so it's on a feed called smoke screen and the subtitle is my friend the serial killer it seems like different every season has a different journalist doing a different story so i'd love to know a little bit about the mechanics of how that works but maybe that's more of an offline conversation but tell us about the story what's going on with this story my friend the serial killer well the my in my friend the serial killer refers to me so when I was uh, 19 years old, I dropped out of college and, you know, was somewhat directionless and which, you know, I somewhat embraced and my parents embraced somewhat less. So um, I got kicked out of the house and ended up hitchhiking as I like to do back then. This is actually in the late 70s. I ended up getting an internship at a small newspaper in Connecticut, and I was desperate to make a hit. I mean, I walked into that newsroom, and it was just, like, so exciting. Um, A newsroom, you know, they've gotten a little bit more sedate because, obviously, everybody's on a computer now, which is so quiet. But back then, you know, you could smoke in the newsroom. And also, uh, (laughs) you know, there was the clatter of typewriters, and then there was the thump, thump, thump of the wire machine, which was, you know, the Associated Press was constantly spewing out news out of its teletype machine. I hit you like one day back from a friend's in Boston. I get picked up by a very nice guy, maybe 10 or so years older than I am. He um, lives in the town where I'm living, Norwich, Connecticut. I worked for the Norwich Bulletin at the time. And he shows me a shortcut home and we start talking and he's out of prison just recently. And I immediately think, oh, this could be a story, you know, the reintegration into society, etc. And I said, oh, I like to, and he's very much up for it. He has me call the supervisor. Supervisor says, do you know what he was in for? At which point I said, actually, no, I, I was not yet a, an experienced reporter. I forgot to ask that question. And he shuts it down. I put his name in a file away in a drawer and it's probably three or so months later and the AP machine now, it's like spitting out news constantly and suddenly when there's big news, the the bells ring, ding, 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 ding. And like bells are going off like crazy. And it turns out that this guy has turned himself in in Florida and confessed to murdering four people. And he got all his victims hitchhiking. So there's this like, oh my God moment. And then there's this, oh my God moment where I say, wow, I know this guy. I have his phone number. Maybe I could get this story, (laughs) which would be uh, exciting for an ambitious 19 year old who's now wants to be a, a real part of that newsroom. And I do. And that's where my friend, the serial killer, takes off. I actually end up visiting him in prison in Florida, and he talks to us. In fact, he confesses a murder to us. We ended up talking to uh, cops and prosecutors. I mean, I'll tell you, you know, a lot of these stories you start out, you don't really know where they're going to go, and some are duller than they should be, and then some give you gifts of excitement. And in this one, it was the latter, It turned out that this killer, his name's Robert Carr, he actually confesses to crimes that nobody knows are crimes. He confesses to four murders. There were no bodies. There were no clues. Nobody had reported the murder. They were known as runaways. He says, no, I'll bring you to the bodies. Without the bodies, there's no crimes, right? So it's quite important. And Dade County, Miami, Florida, sends 
a homicide prosecutor, two homicide detectives, and a medical examiner on a road trip with the serial killer to find the bodies. And as they say in Hollywood, and then hilarity ensues. I'm actually not kidding. I mean, you want a good time, hitch yourself up to a medical examiner. I mean, they got stories to tell. Well, the victims that he was convicted of murdering, Todd Payton, Mark Wilson, Rhonda Holloway, and Tammy Ruth Huntley were his victims, correct? Correct. How did you differentiate yourself from them when he picked you up? Well, you know, I asked him that question because, you know, back then, I mean, I was a late bloomer. I, at 19, year old, 19 years old, I was not shaving. And, um, you know, I was about the same size as Robert Carr. I think I was probably outside of his demographic, his sweet spot. So the two boys were 11 years old and then Tammy was 16 and Rhonda was 21, but he was definitely looking for, you know, he did end up raping a 16-year-old boy. So I maybe was, you know, some small amount of time outside of his target group. But also he was looking for somebody who was not going to give him a hard time. And that meant physically, but also... I think that he did, he he chose people who were in some way passive or maybe disadvantaged. And I imagine going back that I, in that car, maybe showed some signs of aggressiveness, not in relation to him, but in relation to getting this story. When I later sat down with him in prison. He said to me, because the way I had actually gotten to him, that phone number I had in my drawer led to his home. So his wife picked up the phone and I became friendly with his wife. And I became friendly with his daughter, who I actually tracked down four decades later. When I met him in prison, he said to me, just don't bother my wife. And I said, well, why am I bothering her? She seems, you know, to to be open to my visits. And he said, I don't know if you're bothering her or not. But she said you would sell your grandmother for a story, which, you know, I I pled uh, out of context, out of context. (laughs) But I wonder if I gave off that vibe a bit when I was in, you know, in the car, even talking to him, that I was maybe a little bit more aggressive than two 11 year old boys. When he was driving and he picked you up, was he scouting for somebody? Absolutely. That's what he did all the time. He spent hours and hours, days upon days, just driving around, picking people up, hitchhiking. Do you think he's got other victims out there? Well, he claims he doesn't. And since he confessed to murdering people who no one knew were murdered, it kind of seems likely that he's coming clean. There were a lot more rape victims out there. Oh, right. How many rape victims? Probably a dozen. Like, take us back to that car ride. Like, how much do you remember that? And was there any tense moments? Was he friendly enough? Well, I'll tell you what the tense moment was. You know, like, we had a nice conversation. I mean, it was, you know, about him being in prison. But he was congenial. I mean, he was not a creep. You know, he was like an easy guy to talk to. His daughter later described him as the life of the party. I, I don't know that I quite saw that, but definitely he was easy to talk to. And listen, the medical examiner who went on that road trip to unbury those bodies, he said, I thought of him as a friend. Now, the medical examiner was a little weird, but he had a kind of friendly demeanor and came across that way. But the tense moment is when you go for the door on the passenger side to get out, the door handle doesn't work. That's how he got his victims. And not quite freaked out, but, um, you know, anxiety rose. I mean, you just don't know what it is. And you you turn towards him and he said to me, well, I got to get that fixed. And I reached out and opened the door from the outside. But obviously with others, he didn't. He didn't do that. God, what a terrifying moment. With others, he flashed a knife. 
And it's actually incredibly chilling because we have confession tapes, his confession tapes to the cops, incredibly detailed. And I mean, incredibly chilling. You know, he kind of dressed the laundry list or shopping list of the things that he would buy in preparation for his his rape killing sprees. And one of them was he said he he needed a sharp knife, the sharp tip that was shiny so that somebody could see it in the dark. He thought through every detail. Right. So that's like an intimidation factor for him. Yeah. He didn't kill him. He, what he did was he flashed the knife, poked them with it, and wanted them to see that he, he had a big butcher's knife on him. He said that after he showed the knife, he only had to show it once. When you're speaking with someone like this, you're interviewing this man in prison, and you're learning these details, how do you compartmentalize your professional obligation as a journalist and wrapping your head around the fact that you were that close to him and you didn't know what he was capable of, where do you separate yourself there? Where's the line for you? No, that's a really good question. And and I would even say there's a third category, which is, you know, like as a journalist, yeah, I'm looking for the story and the grisly details are impressive and you know that they're going to make readers read on. And then you think, wow, that could have been me. And then you think, well, what is the story to tell here journalistically? Because what the story he wants me to tell is that he tried to get help for his problem, quote unquote problem, which back in the 70s, all that was known was that he was a rapist, or this is in the 80s. All that's known is he's a rapist. And so he says he tried to get help for being a sex offender while he was in Connecticut prison and no one would help him. And so he blamed the state of Connecticut for the murders that he did, which is in some ways just disgusting. But when I was a 19 or 20 year old reporter sitting there across from him, you know, I remember being impressed with that. And I remember then taking that back to the people who ran the therapeutic system inside the prison and the commissioner of corrections in Connecticut and saying, well, what help do you have for people? How do you rehabilitate people? And so I kind of swallowed his story. And, you know, it's it's a good enough story to kind of look at the system that lets people escape. But somehow the compartmentalization that I did allowed me to not treat him as a monster, but to kind of consider him as a victim in part and also elevate him to the perch of expert. You know, here's an expert in what treatment is given in prison. And I think I read, I wrote a series of stories, five Parts that really talks about that it as an issue. And then when I revisited it four decades later, you know, now as a father of three, I, I just felt, oh my God, I, I really just felt kill this guy. You know, like why does society need to this guy? You know, I mean, really, do we care that he can take courses and expensive therapy and be rehabilitated? I mean, the details he told about the killing the 11 year olds and the details he told about killing the 16 year old. I mean, it's like, I don't know, you know, it's like Jeffrey Dahmer with severed heads in his refrigerator, you know, it's not quite that graphic, but kind of horror he inflicted. Is there anything to, to learn that, you know, anything further to be learned by him or, you know, is he also, is he on death row? Is that where he is right now? No, he uh, he had a hearing. So Florida at that point had the death penalty. And you go to a hearing and a judge decides whether you get basically life in prison or, or the death penalty. And he made the same arguments in in court. And the judge said, I'm not condemning you to death. I'm going to give you life in prison. 
I mean, she also gave him like six centuries of life in prison, even though he became eligible for parole after 25 years. And she also recommended that he be sent to a treatment center. And he was sent to a treatment center and he got kicked out of it, in part because he was too busy, said the hospital administrators, too busy writing his autobiography, which was co-written by a Miami Herald journalist and poetically titled Robert Carr, colon, Five Years of Rape and Murder. <laughs> There's some poetry, huh? But what do you learn from a guy like that? What do you, you know, what do you do with a guy like that? I guess I think now I just think there's not that much to learn from a guy like that. I mean, you got to learn that you got to catch him earlier. There is some literature that says that you can rehabilitate a sex offender, a rapist. There's not much that says you can rehabilitate a serial killer. I was going to ask this question because I remember reading, I can't remember the book. It might have been The Killer Across the Table by John Douglas. But John Douglas has this great line where he says, some people just can't be rehabilitated because they were never in the spot before that to go back to. How, how to describe this? Like if you have the inclination to kill in such a violent, gruesome way for the sheer malice of it, that's just been in you. Like there's no going back to a spot that you previously had where you didn't have those feelings. And that's what he was getting at. Is that something that you believe? Because we brought up rehabilitation a, a lot. And you're even at a point you said where you're like, why does society even need this guy? You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm I'm liberal enough that I feel a little guilty about feeling that way. But I I just do feel like maybe making having kids makes you a little bit more conservative, but it's I do manage to put myself in the position of the family of somebody who's been murdered. And I just think all bets are off. I don't know, you know, between the New Testament and the Old Testament, I'm an Old Testament guy. And I, I, you know, I'm not a turn the other cheek guy. So whether it's right or wrong, whether he could be rehabilitated or not, I don't know. Once you start killing kids, close the book on that guy. I thought he was your friend, Steve. You know, that's what the medical examiner said. He said, well, he was my friend. I still wanted them to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, my friend, the serial killer is a, a much better than uh, a title than I got a ride from a serial killer. <laughs> I signed off on that, but it was not my first choice. But, you know, we did. Um, and this is what happens when you do a lot of you know, work with somebody as a journalist writing a story. There were months and months when I talked to him every day. He called me, you know, collect from Florida and into the newsroom. And I I don't know that I became friends with him, but I certainly became friendly. And we behaved as you would expect pals to behave. You know, the managing editor, my boss would talk to him and then he like tell him embarrassing information about my social life. And then he'd tell me what he'd learned. And it was like, I don't know, it was a little crazy. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Well, what, so what do you think? What would you guys do with the serial killer? Would you, you know, vote for rehabilitation or efforts in rehabilitation or... Uh, I'm with you on the Old Testament when it comes to children. There's definitely a line with with children multiple times in a gruesome fashion. There's something that just isn't connecting. You know, I'm not a psychologist or 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 anything of that nature, but there's just something not firing in the brain. Well, let me play devil's advocate for a moment. Then, then wh why did he conf confess then if there if uh. there's no chance of rehabilitation? Right. Good question. I mean, and he said that he confessed because. He didn't feel he could control himself. He actually very specifically says it's because he wanted to stop killing and he had just killed the 16-year-old. He said he had a relationship with her. He felt she liked him, but he also clearly felt an emotional kinship with her. So he walks in and he says, I want to be clear about this and tell you what I did because I don't want to do it again. Maybe a guy like that, you know, maybe there is some traction. He gets this shot at treatment and the judge recommends that he go to a hospital and he goes to this hospital and he has trouble there. And 
I mean, I will say that one of the things that I discovered going back at the story all this time later is that there was something that I'd missed in his personality, a kind of switch that flips. And especially talking to his daughter, I first met her when she was 12 and really only knew her for those handful of months when she was 12. So I I then found her in her 50s. She had all these box of documents because he died in prison. In, of cancer. So she ended up with what was in his cell and she got this box of documents, which included letters she'd sent him. Dear daddy letters, I miss you. I love you. You're the best daddy in the world. Sending these, you know, from a teenager to a serial killer right there. That's wild, you know, but your dad's your dad. He then writes her back and 13 and 14, she gets one kind of letter. And then at 17, her brother sends a photo of her. And now she's a a young woman with blonde hair to her waist, who's apparently very attractive at 17. And her father, a serial killer and rapist, starts sending her a different kind of letter, a letter that's just so aggressive and sexual. I mean, I asked her, I said to her, so what do you think should have happened to your father? And she said, oh, he was born bad. He should have gotten the death penalty. Isn't that crazy? Like who gets the death penalty and who doesn't? Yeah. That's bonkers to me. Yeah. And now you see these, you know, these guys on death row who have been freed from death row because they're innocent. I mean, I mean, if you discuss it as an issue, that's the terrible thing is that executing somebody who's innocent just feels about like the worst crime you could commit. I mean, executing someone who's innocent or how many stories do you hear where someone's just been in prison for 34 years and and they've known that they're, they've been innocent for, you know, 18 of those years, but some sort of bureaucracy has kept yeah. them from being a free a free person like. The whole prison system, for God's sake. Yeah, for God's sake. I just did. So for the burden, one of the great aspects of the burden is, so you have the detective who speaks and 20 of the victim, the people he helped put away, have had their convictions reversed. And one of them is a guy who became a jailhouse lawyer, a really good jailhouse lawyer. And in fact, he founds a, a, a law firm in prison of other jailhouse lawyers three of whom discover they have this same detective in their case. So they band together and really they're the impetus behind reversing his reputation, behind, in a sense, taking him down. But this guy in particular I'm talking about, his name's Derek. He was a bad dude growing up. I mean, what you find with a lot of the people who have had their convictions reversed is that, you know, they were criminals. They were violent. And this guy, Derek, was violent and he was a thug. And, you know, he told me I I shot people. There was a, a time when his father was murdered and his father was murdered. And the hit was apparently called down by a guy who went by at that point by Baby Sam. Baby Sam spends 35 years in prison. It turns out he was investigated by the same cop, Detective Scarcella, who helped put away those 20 people and helped put away Derek. And Baby Sam appeals his conviction on that basis and has his his conviction reversed. And I called up Derek, a Derek whose father was killed in a hit supposedly ordered by Baby Sam. And I said, Derek, Scarcella has just gotten your the person who may be responsible for your father's death out of prison. What do you think? And Derek said, let him out of prison. Let him out. Scarcella deserves to be in prison. So uh, uh, it was a really interesting choice to make. And then he said to me, and how long has he been in there? And I said, 35 years. He said, 35 years in prison is a long time to be in prison. I was in prison 31 years and I hurt a lot of families. It's too long to be in prison. So to your question or to the point of, you know, does every murder deserve to require that the, that the murderer be put to death? You know, a guy in Derek's position says no. 
I, I would like to comment on when I was playing devil's advocate. Um, yeah, no, I, I think you're right about this guy, about Carr here. I don't know that there was any way to rehabilitate him. Well, tell us a little bit about Orbit Media. Yeah, so Orbit Media is the company I founded with a few other people. So one of my co-founders is Fisher Stevens, who's the Oscar winning documentarian. He's got a role on Succession. He's an actor, and then he's a, the director of the documentary Beckham, which just came out. So he's um, a kind of great creative storyteller and kind of sets the tone for the company and for the other founders, because none of us are audio natives. We really come from telling stories in other mediums. I have a person who ran Blumhouse TV, which is a very vaunted uh, TV and film production company. And so she kind of comes to the TV end. And then a fellow journalist, Dax Devlin Ross, who's a, a fellow journalist and has told a number of really powerful stories. So the premise behind the company was really, we're people who know how to tell compelling stories. And we really love the audio medium. So what we're going to do is we're going to pair ourselves with really talented audio engineers, audio producers, and tell really compelling stories. We happen to kind of find those stories. And it's a field that I've long been in and been fascinated with in true crime. You know, the stakes in true crime are always high. The stories are always compelling. There's loss. There's grief. There's often triumph. So we've really kind of landed there. Now, you know, we kind of go where the story is. And we've got actually another podcast coming out. So we just dropped Empire on Blood, the director's cut, I guess, three weeks ago. And we've created a feed now, a true crime feed. So as a company, we want to be able to, like you guys have done, kind of create a, a network of true crime stories <clears throat> that a person can go to and listen to. So they can go to one place, they can hear kind of quality storytelling. So we're determined to kind of keep this feed alive with great storytelling. And we've got another one coming out. It's called Avenger. It's a, about crime, but it's about a woman in Argentina. She's 19 years old. She's an, a political activist on campus She's kidnapped at the time. There's a military hunter running um, Argentina. She's kidnapped off the streets, thrown in a prison camp. Most of the people in that prison camp are executed by being tossed out of planes in the middle of the night. Alive, by the way. She avoids that fate, comes out, becomes a journalist and tracks down the pilots. And so 20 years later... She gets justice. So we're putting that in our feed that'll come in October called Avenger, unless we get sued by Marvel. <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's an incredible story. What a what that a cool is. company you have there. Thank you. Yeah, no, so we're really proud of the company. And you know, it's I come from publishing and magazines and it's just proven to be a great experience to kind of be involved in a medium that I fell in love with. Um, you know how intimate it is and how kind of powerful the storytelling can be when you can really hear people talking, all those casual conversations that you you can't really hear or feel or read on the page um, becomes such an important part of this tone of voice, tears, everything. And then, you know, the ability to kind of negotiate these waters yourself. You know, I had been worked for people for a long time and the ability to kind of green light projects and to say, this is an important story. We should do it. These are great characters. We should do it. It's really wonderful. It, it sure is. But I can't let this go without <laughs> asking you how someone named Steve Fishman partnered with someone named Fisher Stevens <laughs> and the name of their company is not some combination of that. It's yeah, it absolutely does. incredible. Well, you know, the other twist to that is that Fisher Stevens is born Stephen Fisher. <laughs> really? <laughs> <That's a laughs> so, Stephen Fishman and Stephen Fisher. We, we did think of the two fishes, actually, at one point. That was our, our, both our nicknames growing up was Fish. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it's that incredible. is incredible. We, uh, it was, it was, you know, we, 
when we uh, were first um, looking at uh, interviewing you again, I think we both stumbled upon that and was like, "Like, am I seeing things? Like, how is this possible? <laughs> how did the universe do this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so wonderful." <laughs> thanks so much for having me guys <laughs> yeah thanks so much for uh for spending some time with us here steve this was a really great conversation yeah it was really fun and we'll look forward to your next podcast and and i hope people will listen to empire on blood the director's cut and the burden is up there too yeah all, all of the shows that you have listed on orbit great work with everything uh let's not have it be six years before you come back on let's make this a regular thing <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm down. Let's do it.